And tonight, the woman that we will be looking at um, is found in three of the Gospels, but she's not mentioned by name, but rather as the woman with an issue of blood for 12 years. Now, the Bible could have said there was a woman with an issue she had been struggling with for 12 years. As in the case of Paul's issue, uh, we read about in 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul talking about what he calls his thorn in the flesh, which was actually better described in the original language as this tent stake within me. He said, concerning th this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, in Paul's affliction, we are given his name, but not the issue. In the woman's affliction, we are given the issue, but not her name. God chose to heal the woman, and he chose not to heal Paul's affliction, but rather to give him sufficient grace in the affliction. It is believed that we're not told what the thorn in Paul's flesh was so that we could identify with him. In whatever affliction, we find ourselves suffering, and we can take comfort in knowing that God's grace is sufficient in whatever our struggles are. But we are not left to wonder what the woman was suffering from. Every woman here of age knows what it's like to have a menstrual cycle. We know what it feels like leading up to it. We know what it feels like during it. And we know what it's like the days afterwards, which we typically look forward to. This woman never stopped bleeding for 12 years. The loss of blood would have caused her to grow weaker by the day, and I can only imagine how out of whack her hormones would have been. I remember some really bad periods before I had children, and I had horrible cramps, throwing up, passing out, but they only lasted a few days, or a couple days, actually. This woman never had relief. Her bleeding continued, not for days or weeks or even for a few years. Her bleeding had gone on for more than a decade. While the story has something to say to both men and women alike, it also speaks to the fact that our Lord understands the unique issues of women. They are not a mystery to him, nor are they a taboo subject he's embarrassed to talk about. I remember when I was in fourth grade, we had our first sex education class. We were told about the menstrual cycle. And we were also instructed that when it was that time of the month, rather than mentioning what was happening, if we needed to inform someone, we could say to them that Aunt Martha had come for a visit. <laughs> and speaking of aunts, my aunt told me that when she was a girl, they never talked about such things. So when she had her first period, she went running to her mother in tears because she thought she was dying. But aren't you glad that we have a heavenly father that knows all about us and there's nothing we can't share with him. He understands everything we are going through or ever will go through. So let's begin reading about the woman with the issue blood in Mark chapter five, verses 25 through 34. So that's Mark chapter five, beginning with verse 25. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years, and she suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched me? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitudes thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Now, I also want to read a portion from Luke's gospel about this encounter the woman had with Jesus. In fact, the next couple of verses we're going to read about this woman has probably made her the most influential woman of the New Testament in my life. 
So please turn to Luke 8, verse 45. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with them said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you, and you say, who touched me? But Jesus said, somebody touched me, for I perceive power going out from me. Now, several years ago, as I read this story, the Lord began speaking to my heart and teaching me the difference of being among the multitudes that follow and throng Jesus and the woman who reached out and touched Jesus and received power coming from him. From that time on, my prayer has been that I would not be one that brushes up against Jesus as he passes by, but that I would reach out and touch him so that I would know him as she knew him. And also because during some times of brokenness in my life, the Lord has ministered to me through an old hymn that always brought me encouragement and reminds me of this woman. And the words to that song are, let me touch him, let me touch Jesus. Let me touch him as he passes by. So when I shall reach out to others, they shall know him, they shall live and not die. Just to be his hand extended, reaching out to the oppressed, let me touch him, let me touch Jesus so that others might know and be blessed. I was straying so far from Jesus. I was lonely, had no peace from within. Then the hand of my Savior touched me. Now I'm reaching to others in sin. Let me touch him. Let me touch Jesus. And to have a better understanding of what it meant for this woman to touch Jesus, as he walked among the multitudes, we have to look at the Mosaic law concerning her issue of blood. Leviticus 15 verses 25 through 27 tell us, tells us, if a woman has a flow of blood for many days that is unrelated to her menstrual period, or if the blood continues beyond the normal period, she is ceremonially unclean, as during her menstrual period, the woman will be unclean as long as the discharge continues. Any bed she lies on and any object she sits on during that time will be unclean, just as during her normal menstrual period. If any of you touch these things, you will be ceremonially unclean. You must wash your clothes and bathe yourself in water, and you will remain unclean until evening." So this woman was ostracized from society. Not only was she considered unclean, anyone who came into contact with her would have become ceremonially unclean. It had been years since she was allowed to go to the temple, invited to a home, able to hug her friends or family. We may better understand it as she was living in quarantine for 12 years, sick and alone. She was known as the woman with the issue of blood. This had become her identity. How many times has she tried different cures? How far has she traveled to meet the next physician? How much money did she spend? How many times had her hopes been dashed? Mark tells us that she suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. And did you catch that she suffered many things from many physicians? This tells us that not only could they not cure her, but the ways that they tried to cure her added to her suffering. By the time she came to Jesus, she was desperate. And this is where we need to see ourselves if we truly want to touch Jesus. We need to realize we are lost and unclean without Christ. We could search the world over and go from one thing to another looking for healing or fulfillment in this world, but we will never be better. In fact, we'll grow worse. It's only through Jesus that we can go in peace and be healed. When we are desperate, we cry out to Jesus. We're focused. We know we need him. We realize he is the only one that can give us what our heart longs for. By the time this woman met Jesus, not only was she desperate, she had nothing to offer him. There was no thought of a deal. He had what she needed, and if only she could touch 
the hem of her gar his garment, she would be made whole. Now, it may sound strange to us that she thought she would be healed by touching the hem of his garment, but to her, the hem, or border, or wing, as it's sometimes called, had great significance. You may recall the story of Ruth and how her mother-in-law, Naomi, instructed her to uncover Boaz's feet and lay down. When he woke up and asked who was there, she replied, I am your servant, Ruth. Spread the corner of your covering over me, for you are my kinsman redeemer. She may have been thinking about Malachi 4 too. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings, and you will go free, leaping with joy like calves led out to pasture. Or the instruction given to Moses in Numbers 15. Speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to make tassels of the, on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a blue thread in the tassels on the corners. So in the day when this woman lived on earth, the hem of a person's garment became part of their identity. That's why the Pharisees wore elaborate tassels on the corners of their garments. They wanted to make sure that everyone identified them with God and what they considered their importance to him. Jesus would have worn the plain blue thread in the hem of his garment like God had instructed the Jewish people to do. And I read that they wore an outer robe that was a large piece of heavy woolen cloth draped over the wearer's back in such a way that the tassel of one of the corners hung between their shoulder blades. When the woman says, if only I could touch the hem of his garment, I would be made whole, she is putting her all of her faith in that what that hymn represents. Much like we would say, we believe in the name of Jesus. It's not a magical name any more than it was a magical robe. It represented to this woman all that he is. She believed he was the long-awaited Messiah, her Redeemer, and that there was healing in his wings. She believed it so strongly that she was willing to risk any amount of scorning, persecution, and perhaps even death for what she was about to do. She made her way through the crowd. She wasn't about to be held back, not this time. Nothing was more important to her than to get to Jesus. She no longer cared what others thought of her. Jesus was her last hope, and she was not going to let this opportunity pass her by. She finally reached him. In the press of the crowd, she was able to reach out and to touch his garment. And just like that, we're told immediately the fountain of her blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Twelve long years she had suffered. She was exhausted, weak, and hurting, an outcast. And immediately, with just one touch, she was made whole. The realization must have been overwhelming. It had been so long since she had felt good. And oh, how wonderful to feel good before she could even process all this meant for her, we're told. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? Exuberant joy is replaced with fear and trembling. She heard the disciples say, Master, the multitude strong and press you, and you say, who touched me? Perhaps he would let it go and keep moving, but he already knew who it was. He didn't turn to find out who touched him. Mark says he looked around to see who had done this thing. He wasn't going to let this moment pass without acknowledging he knew. When the woman touched him, they connected. She had entered into a personal relationship with Christ. Jesus wanted to bring it out in the open, like our relationship with him should be, both private and public. The light of Christ had entered into her, and he was about to take that light and set it on a hilltop. Matthew tells us, when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and fell down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. Now certainly, she had reason to be fearful of the crowd. If they knew she was unclean, they would have been appalled and angry that she would dare defile them. But if that was her biggest fear, 
I don't think she would have declared to Jesus in the presence of all the people the reason that she had touched him. I think Jesus was her last hope. He healed her, but would he accept her? Once he knew that she was unclean, would he turn away like every other person had done in her life? Oh, to live with her affliction for 12 years was almost unbearable, but to be healed of it? To experience freedom from the pain and misery she had endured for so long, for that freedom to be taken away would have been unbearable. Jesus held the life that she only dreamed of in his hands. What would he say to her now? Picture Jesus waiting for her to look up at him with her tear-stained eyes. She sees his face and hears his voice. The first word out of Jesus' mouth is, daughter. This is a hallelujah moment. Daughter, what a wonderful word, rich in meaning. She had reached out to identify with Jesus, and he had accepted her as one of his own. No longer an outcast, a daughter with all the rights and privileges the name suggests. All the responsibilities of a father had been taken on by Jesus. He was her healer, her protector, her provider, her security. He was declaring to her and everyone else that she belonged to him. And I believe this is why we're not given her name. Because daughter is the most precious name that you will ever be called from our Heavenly Father. What the world calls you doesn't matter. That's not your identity. Once you come to Christ, you are his daughter. And while the name daughter was still ringing in her ears like a beautiful melody, Jesus says to her, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Now, faith is only as good as the object in which it is placed. She had placed the full weight of her faith in Jesus Christ, and he had proven to be all that she thought him to be. She had come to him desperate with nothing to offer him. She was looking for grace, the kind of grace that he alone could give her. He did not disappoint her. He gave to her exceedingly and abundantly more than she could have imagined or hoped for. Jesus' words to her, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction, meant much more than physical healing. Jesus said, Somebody touched me, for I perceived power going out from me. When this woman reached out to touch Jesus, the connection was made. When we are connected to Christ, we are made holy, righteous, free, and whole. She's no longer an outcast or just one of the crowd, not merely an acquaintance or even just a friend. She is a daughter. John 1.12 tells us, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe on his name. She believed, and she received immediately and continually. Her faith placed in Christ had made her whole. Jesus tells her to go in peace. This phrase is used often in the Old Testament as a blessing on another's actions or intent. Peace conveys the message of harmony, security, safety, prosperity, and tranquility of being right with God. The connection had been made. Christ's power flowed from him to her. Jesus had healed this woman for a purpose. All that he does is done for a purpose. He is working all things together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And if you're familiar with the story, you know it is always linked to the story of Jarius. So let's go back to Mark's account, beginning with verse 21. Now, when Jesus crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jarius by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now, Jarius was a man like the woman who was desperate. 
We're told he was a leader of the synagogue, so lack of money was probably not an issue. If doctors could heal his daughter, he had the means to pay for them. But no amount of money could buy him what he so desperately wanted. Like the woman, Jesus was his only hope. He had reached Jesus and made his request, and Jesus had agreed to go with him to his daughter. He must have fought back the urge to push the crowds away so they could get to his home faster. But just as they began making their way, Jesus stops. It was here that the woman had touched him. Now, can you imagine what was going through Jairus' mind? Maybe something like, who cares who touched you? Come on, let's get going. But Jesus doesn't seem to be in any hurry. He stops to have a conversation with the woman. Verse 35 tells us, while he was speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house and said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any farther? Now, before Jairus had a chance to be devastated by the news, we are told in verse 36, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. Well, Jairus had to make a choice here. Will he give up? Will he lose faith? Will he tell Jesus not to bother coming to his house? His daughter is already dead. But wait, what had just happened here in front of him? The woman, what did, what did she say? Something about 12, 12, 12 years. Yes, the woman had been afflicted for 12 years. Matthew's account tells us, for he had an only daughter about 12 years of age, and she was dying. Jairus' daughter was 12 years old. I wonder if those 12 years flashed before his eyes, all the joy she had been to him, the hugs, the smiles, the plans he had for her future. So blessed and happy. What a stark contrast to the woman who had lived in such misery for the past 12 years, his mind racing back and forth between his daughter and the woman who was dying, but is now well, and his daughter, who just a few days ago was full of life, but they tell him she is dead now? He loved her so much. He was willing to do anything to save her. She was his daughter. 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 Isn't that what Jesus called this woman? He knows. He knows what it means to have the heart of a father. Perhaps fear was starting to lose its grip. He probably began to think about the woman's testimony. She claimed that Jesus had healed her. This man, Jesus, standing before him, telling him, do not be afraid, only believe. He had just healed this woman. He had the power to heal. What did it matter what the messengers told him? Luke's account tells us, Jesus said, do not be afraid, only believe, and she will be made well. He would believe this man, Jesus. He would continue to walk with him, and he would do whatever he tells him to do. All Jairus' hope was tied up in Jesus. He would abide with him and trust that he would do whatever he said he would do. So they continued on their way. Luke 8, 50, when Jesus came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except for Peter, James, and John, and the father and mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her. But Jesus said, do not weep. She's not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. But he put them all outside, took her by the hand, and called, saying, little girl, arise. And then her spirit returned, and she arose immediately. Jesus did what he said he would do. Jesus always does what he says he will do. And what he does is always with our best interests at heart. When Jesus asked who touched him, it was not to shame or accuse the woman. All his intentions for her was for good. He wanted to bless her, and he wanted to bless others through her. When he stopped on the way to Jairus' house, it wasn't because he was insensitive to Jairus' desperation to get back to his daughter. He knew the messengers were already on their way with the report that she was dead. What Jarius needed was hope. The healing of the woman would bring that. 
how different the story would have been if he would have let his doubts and fears turn him away from Jesus. But he didn't. He continued with Jesus, even though the situation seemed hopeless. And think about John the Baptist as he sat in prison about to be beheaded. He would have remembered the day recorded for us in John chapter 1, verses 29 through 34. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me. I did not know him, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came, baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and I have testified that this is the Son of God. John was so sure on that day. But as he sat in prison, some doubts began to arise. Instead of nursing his doubts or stuffing them inside by trying to pretend he didn't have any, he demonstrates to us what we should do when doubts arise. He went to Jesus. He wanted to hear what Jesus would say to him. Luke 7, 19 tells us, And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And that very hour, he cured many infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits, and to many blind he gave sight. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell the John the things that you have seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. John loved Jesus, and Jesus loved John, but that didn't stop doubts from creeping into his thoughts while he was imprisoned unjustly, facing a death sentence. He needed assurance, and he knew where to go for it. Jesus gave John the assurance he needed by providing the testimonies of others. He said to the messengers, Go and tell John the things you have seen and heard. What Jesus had just demonstrated to them was what John knew to be true of the promised Messiah. Jesus was fulfilling the prophecies about himself, and these messengers became witnesses. The assurance that John brought that excuse me, the assurance that Jesus brought to John wasn't that everything would be all right. In fact, he was never released from prison, and shortly after this, John was beheaded. The assurance that Jesus gave to John was, Yes, I am who you believe me to be. And who John believed Jesus to be was worth dying for. And Paul, he didn't receive physical healing, but he came to see his thorn in his side as a blessing. He said, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Those that touch Jesus receive power from him. They become a witness for him, a light on a hill for all to see. Some are healed and some are not, but all receive power. They are connected to the source of power, which is Jesus. They are abiding in the vine as described in the Gospel of John 15:5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Those that abide in the vine don't run back to the vine when they need a touch from the Lord. They stay connected. They seek him out daily. They are always aware of his presence. They long for his touch continually. They rely on his strength, knowing they have no strength aside from what he gives. And this is the lesson I have learned and I'm learning from the woman with the issue of blood. 
There's a difference in being in the crowd and brushing up against Jesus in the shuffle of life and those who want to touch him, to know him, and to receive power from him. Yes, the woman did receive physical healing, but I believe it was the healer, not the healing, that changed her life. If she had walked away and spent the rest of her life with an issue of blood, I believe the word daughter would have still rang in her ear like a sweet melody. She had met the healer. The healing was secondary. David McCaslin from Our Daily Bread said, if we only want something Jesus can do for us, our relationship with him will be limited. When we want Jesus himself, he brings completeness to our lives. Christ wants first and foremost to make us whole. So how do we touch Jesus? Well, like the woman, we recognize our need for him. If we are trying to fulfill our lives with things of this world that oppose the things of God, we will never find lasting satisfaction. This world will take all that we have and leave us worse off. Christ is the only one who can meet our deepest need. Like the woman, we can't let anything stand in the way of reaching Christ. She didn't let her infirmities, her weakness, what others thought of her, or possible persecution stop her. And this can apply to anything that God is calling you to do. And it may mean a complete change in your life, or it may simply be getting into the routine of a morning devotional time. There will always be opposition to the things God calls you to do. But don't let anything stop you. Be determined to make God your priority and be focused. Have you ever been talking to someone and you know that they're really not listening, or worse yet, they're scrolling on their phone when you're together? Sometimes our prayer lives can become like that. And I know that there are times I'm reading the Bible and I realize I have no idea what I just read because I wasn't focused. My mind was drifting to other things. When that happens, I try to remember to ask myself if I'm touching God or just passing by in the crowd. And that helps me to redirect my thoughts and my focus. When the woman reached for Jesus because of all, the woman reached for Jesus because of all she knew him to be. If we want to touch Jesus, we have to know who we are reaching for. He is the God of the Bible, not a genie in a bottle. If you truly want to touch Jesus, get to know him and allow him to be God. Trust his choices. Stay in the word. Read it, study it, meditate on it, listen to it, treasure it. His word is how we know him for who he truly is. And she believed. Jesus said her faith made her well. She had a living faith that was seen by her actions. She believed there was healing in his wings, and that belief drove her. And I admonished myself to keep believing. Don't stop believing. When doubts arise, Take them to Jesus. Let the witness of his word and the testimonies of other believers encourage you. We should check our actions to see if our faith is seen in them. And we should ask God to increase our faith. I love the response of the Father in Mark 9 to Jesus' statement. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And the Father said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And don't be afraid to tell him all that's on your heart. He knows if the choice he has made for you is painful. He knows if you don't understand. He knows what you're feeling. You can't hide from him, and he doesn't want you to. He wants you to come to him, to process your thoughts and your life with him. Talk to him, and then listen. Search the scripture for a word that fits your circumstance. As we see, we aren't promise healing in every situation, but we are invited to ask for healing, and we are told that if he chooses not to heal, he will give us sufficient grace, and that he will use our afflictions to form us into his image, to help others, to show his strength, to be a witness, to draw you to himself. When we surrender to Jesus, the hardest circumstances of our lives, we will begin to say with so many others, I would never have chosen this, but I wouldn't take anything for what God has taught me through it. And do remember that you are his daughter and all that that means. You are loved 
and accepted. You belong to God. He has bought you with the precious blood of his son, Jesus. He sees you as the apple of his eye. He is your protector, provider, and security. He is loving, kind, compassionate, and faithful. He will never leave you nor forsake you. The woman's response to Jesus was to fall down before him, and we too should fall down before him, worship him. He is worthy of all honor and praise. Recognize his holiness, his majesty, his sovereignty. Acknowledge that his thoughts are not our thoughts, neither are his ways our ways. He is superior in all his ways. Delight yourself in the Lord. Rejoice in the abundant, overflowing, unconditional, never-ending love he has for you. Well, these are a few of the reasons that this woman has been influential in my life. And um, a couple weeks ago, while Karen was teaching, she said she was challenged as a young Christian when Raul Reese said, you are as close to the Lord as you want to be. And I've asked Trinity to sing a couple songs in order to give us an opportunity to ask ourselves, how close do I want to be to Jesus? Am I touching him, always reaching toward him, receiving his power to live for him? Or have I been content in being in the crowd, going along, brushing against him occasionally, a life that is not marked by his power and what he wants to do through me? I encourage you to reach out and touch Jesus. James 4, 8 tells us, draw near to God and he will draw near to you.